praise God. And the youngsters are welcome to go this morning. The oldsters may be seated. Yes, sir. Candy rain. Yes, sir. Bring us some bags of candy. No peanuts, please. Okay. Hey, man, just regular service. They got evangelist. Or? Okay. All right. All right. So you remember that if you want to go this evening. Um, is today the 20th? It is the 20th. I've had a busy week. <laughs> it's just <laughs> time flies. And God is good. Amen. You may be seated this morning. Thank you, Brother Brooks, for reminding us of that. Psalms chapter, 90, cha Psalms chapter tw 96. I'll get there eventually. Psalms 96 and verse 1. Well, if I had, I, it's all right taking my time, but start taking my wife's time. That's where we got to. That's where you got to be careful, Brother Lee. Brother Lee's not married to my wife. I can just tell you all that right now. <laughs> They're all ladies, but they ain't all the same, Brother Lee. <laughs> my wife's so spiritual, sometimes she knows where I should have stopped. Right, right there, you know. Right, you had it all covered. You just kept throwing more on the same fire. <laughs> Yes, dear. <laughs> Psalms 96, verse 1. Sing unto the Lord a new song. Amen. Sing unto the Lord all the earth. Sing unto the Lord. Bless his name. Show forth his salvation from day to day. Amen. Declare his glory among the heathen. His wonders among all people. For the Lord is great and greatly to be praised. Everybody say praised. Amen. He is to be feared above all. Back up for me, Sister Hurst. Go back to verse 3. Declare his glory among, tell other people about what he's done. Now go to verse 4. And that is called praise. When you say what God has done, it's praise. Amen. You're giving him accolades for his accomplishments. Amen. He is to be feared above all gods. Why? Because all other gods are just imaginations. He's the only one that's really a god. <clears throat> the devil's not a god. For all the gods of the nations are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Honor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. Given to the Lord, O ye kindreds of the people, give unto the Lord glory and strength. Give unto the Lord. Now, when it says given to him glory and strength, that means demonstrate the greatness of God Amen. through your life, yes, through your abilities. You demonstrate. You use your talents to glorify God. You use your time to glorify God. You use your treasures to glorify God. Give unto the Lord the glory due unto his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. Verse 9, oh, worship. Everybody say worship. There's a difference in worship and praise. Oh, worship the Lord in the beauty. So worship is more than just clapping hands, lifting voice. It has to do with holiness. You know, you can be completely quiet walking through Walmart and be worshiping the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Amen. Worship may be emotional, but the reason for worship is not emotional. Because you can have the worst of days and worship the Lord. Amen. Or you can have the best of days and worship the Lord. Because worship is not based on your circumstances or your situations at all. You can get the worst doctor's report and worship the Lord. Because again, you may be upset, depressed, in your physical man, but you still know and realize God is above all things. His status has not changed. Mine may have, but his did not. Oh, worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Fear before him all the earth. 
That word fear means reverence. Say among the heathen, I guess you'd use the word all for us, have all of God. You ever heard somebody say, man, that guy is awesome. That means, man, I idolize him. I wish I could do what he does. We, and, and we are in the right perspective. We are to idolize God. We are to be just wowed by God. Well, what's he done? Well, go look in the mirror. If that ain't big enough, look up in the stars. The greatness of God is just to be amazing. And it is amazing. Just the devil gets us so distracted with this, that, and the other that we forget the greatness and the awesomeness of God. Amen. Say among the heathen that the Lord reigneth, the world also shall be established, that it shall not be moved. Global climate change ain't going to mess with it. God's got it. He shall judge the people righteously. Verse 11, let the heavens rejoice, let the earth be glad. That's nature, worshiping the Lord. Let the sea roar and the fullness thereof. Let the field be joyful and all that is therein. Then shall all the trees of the wood rejoice. Verse 13, before the Lord, for he cometh, for he cometh to judge the earth. He shall judge the world with righteousness and all the people with his truth. Amen. Let's go to uh, Psalms 100, verse 1. One hundred and verse 1. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord. That's what I do a lot. I sing sometimes, but make a joyful noise all the time. <laughs> make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness, not sadness, gladness. You can serve the Lord with sadness and God not be happy about it. David said like this, I was glad when they said unto me. Let's go to church. Amen. I've heard of, seen people. Buy tickets to concerts, to sporting events, to this, that, or the other, and pay a lot of money. And if they want to get really close, they show up with their tents the day before and set up tents in the line to make sure they got as close to the action as they could. That lets you know how excited they were about where they were going. Right. What would happen on Saturday? We punched our spouse and said, Do you know what day it is? Saturday. That's right. That means one more day. And we get to go to the house of the Lord. What if we woke up Wednesday morning and said, Whew, I'm going to get to eat manna from heaven today. God's got a meal prepared for me today. Amen. Wonder how God, excited God would get if we got excited. Faithfulness is required and faithfulness is good. But faithfulness alone doesn't make God excited. God wants us to be glad. Some of the things we do can become mundane routines that we know how many songs we sing, we know just how we do, what we do, and if we're not careful, it becomes just a ritual. We get on to other religions for having rituals. But you know, you can do the right things and they can become a ritual. Brother James, you say, the difference in a grave and a rut is a, a rut has both ends knocked out of it. Still a grave. We got to be careful that we don't lose the all of God. Right. Every once in a while, it'd be good for us to go pray and say, Lord, give me back the all of you. Thank you 
Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know ye that the Lord, he is God. It is he that hath made us, and not we ourselves. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving, into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name. For the Lord, that right there, if the Lord wasn't good, we'd all be gone. The Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting and his truth endureth to all generations. Amen. Amen. Thank God for his goodness. Now David wrote these psalms that we read this morning, but you have to understand David's situation when he wrote these psalms. He's running for his life. He's being chased by a wicked king who he was serving the best he could, doing right in the eyes of the Lord. And because he did right, he got done wrong. If it had been me, I'd have probably been over sucking my thumb saying, this ain't fair, God, I don't deserve this. How dare you let this happen to me? God, you could have stopped this. And he could have. But he didn't. So what do you do when God don't stop it? Well, here's what David did. Great is the Lord. And greatly to be praised. Would I be able to praise the Lord if I found myself in David's situation? A young man. Your country's at war and... You volunteer to fight. The brothers had to go. David could have got out of it. David was excused from the battle. He said, no, I want to fight. You're not drafted. You sign up freely because you believe in the cause and, and your very first battle, you are the linchpin to decide the victory over a giant, to bring your country victory and favor. You are now a hero to the nation. Upon returning from the battlefield, they throw a parade in your honor. Saul has killed his thousands. David his tens of thousands. You're on top of the world. Not hard to shout when you're on top of the world. You end up being promoted to general as a reward for your bravery. And then you marry the king's daughter, the girl of your dreams. You buy a house together and you continue to lead the army from victory to victory for the king. And you become a household name across the country. Everything is great. But then, the leader of your country gets jealous of your success and beloved reputation and tries to kill you twice. You barely escape his assassination by sneaking out a window and your wife has to stay behind to cover for you and now you're in now you're in the wild and you're on the run and you're hiding from cave to cave while the manhunt from your own brethren is after you to find what city you're in looking for you you're doing things you never conceived of having to do you used to eat milk and honey at the king's table now you're eating grasshoppers whatever you can get a hold of you lie to your pastor to get him to help you and you end up getting him killed because of it and David did you're so scared for your lives of your family that you send them away to a foreign country you have to go completely off the grid and you end up camping in a cave, the cave of Dulem. Your only dubious bit of help comes from a bunch of misfits, a bunch of rogues who start turning up at your cave. Some are dodging debt collectors and showing up, and some are thieves. They're expecting you to feed them and clothe them and lead them. And their numbers begin to swell. And that makes it a logistical problem. You're trying to hide. Harder to hide. Soon you've got 600 of these misfits for your army. <laughs> and here you are. They're in your quiet place. People are starting to notice. And they report on you. And now the manhunt is on again. And you'll spend years on the run sleeping. It wasn't just a month event. This was years. Sleeping on rough dirt and rock. Eating whatever you can find. And 
and starving when you cannot. And you'll live in constant fear for your life as a, ha a hated and a haunted man. And what did you do? You did what you thought was right before God and before the king. How much thankfulness could you or I generate to sing and write songs of praise about God, to play our instruments, to sing unto the Lord in this kind of situation? But somehow in the midst of running for his life, David composed some of the most beautiful songs of praise to God in human history. We still read them today. He didn't seem like he had much to praise God for. But really it's worship because worship has nothing to do with your situation. You can worship God when everything's going wrong. Imagine the nights David spent in the cave of Doolam pulling it his cover off of his shepherd's harp and beginning to run his fingers across the strings. And heads would lift as the men would begin to hear David sing unto the Lord. That rough cave became a holy sanctuary unto the Lord. A place of desperation became a place of deity because David lifted his voice in praise and worship to God. David could easily have fallen into the trap that many of us do when we face reversals. My goodness, how easy it is when we get the raise on the job or everything's going right and everything, everybody's doing what they're supposed to do and we're getting treated right to praise the Lord. But what do we do when it's all going wrong? Well, one thing you can do, you can come to the pastor and I'll look at you and say, I don't know. I'm as confused as you are. Because I could tell you some stuff that happened in my life. That I don't know. Nevertheless, I've decided to live for God and praise Him and worship Him anyway. Our Lord giveth and He taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In everything, give thanks. Didn't say for everything, thank God. Some things you can't give God thanks for. But in everything, you can give God thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Well, how can I, how can I give God thanks when I'm in this storm? Because your God is over the storm. Well, what if the storm takes me out? Well, then your God let it. He's over every storm. See, praise can be solely emotional. Some people praise God for what they got. Some people praise God for what they need. But worship has nothing to do with what you got or what you need. Worship comes from the root word worth. Worthship. He's worth E to be praised. It's worth it to put God first. He's worth my time. He's worth my treasure. He's worth my talent. He's worth everything I can give Him. He's worth it. Some people praise the Lord. I've seen I've seen in my life. I saw years ago there was a lady. She'd come to church once in a blue moon. But it seemed like it, I was young, maybe more. I may have missed sometimes she came, so I don't want to be too harsh. But I guess the reason it stood out to me was because as a young kid in church, it seemed like every time she'd come, she'd put on a shout and fit. She'd scream, hoop and holler and put on a show. Then you wouldn't see her again for a long time. And then she'd come and hoop and holler and put on a show. Now, she may have been praising the Lord, but worship is a lot more than just emotions. If you worship God, you're faithful to God. 
There were people who never shouted, hooped and hollered, never knew they, but they were always there and always had their hands raised and always praising God and always giving to God. And they were, why? Because he was worth it. I hope that makes sense of the difference in praise. Now God's worth worth the praise. He deserves the praise. But Lord, let us climb above praise to worship. While we do at times see David being heartbreakingly honest with God about his desperate situation. Far more often we see him worshiping and praising God. David decided, as we must as well, that no matter what the circumstances in life might be, God was still worthy to be worshiped. Because worship comes from worth-ship. He's worth everything. Anything God asks me for, he's worth more than that. People who struggle with tithing and offering, they're not worshiping the Lord. Because if God worked up, walked up and said, look, I want 90%, and you were a worshiper, you'd say, well, you're worth it. Matter of fact, God, you're worth all of it. God's worth everything. I'm not saying for you to do this, but I've known people who've given their entire check. Didn't know how they were going to make it. They just said, the Lord dealt with me. And I felt like it's what he, and so I'm going to do it. He's worth it. Were you expecting him to give you a buffet money? I don't know if he is or not. I may just eat crackers. And if I eat crackers, he's still worth it. Amen. He might let me go hungry. I don't know. I'm not making a deal with God. I'll do this if you do this. No, I'm just saying, God, you want it. You're worth it. Somebody say, praise the Lord. Worship is connected to holy reverence or the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. If you don't begin with the fear of the Lord, you're foolish. Oh, worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Fear before him all the earth. It is an understanding of who God is. We should be terrified of the Lord. Now, sometimes we get terrified of diseases and people and situations and this and that. And those are normal human emotions. But we honestly, seriously, should be terrified of the Lord. And I, I'm talking about not just the good fear, but the bad fear. Because it is a terrible thing to fall in the hands of a living God. You don't want to anger the Lord. He can take a smirk away like that. Yeah. Oh, Miriam and Aaron thought they were all that in a bag of cheese. They're going to do despite to Moses. All of a sudden, Aaron, uh, Miriam had leprosy. They went from thinking they were really spiritual to, oh, God, help us. God can knock the pride out of us so fast. They well, how do the wicked get away with it? Uh, they won't get away with it forever. But if we're really, really wise, we'll fear the Lord. We'll walk before him reverently and holy and circumspectly. And I failed, but I need to do better than that. He is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the nations are idols. But the Lord made the heavens and the earth. Worship is about him and not about us. Worship is all of God. Everything we do in all of God is worship. Some can praise when they get what they want. But God in the Bible is not looking for praisers. 
Think about it. The earth is praising the Lord. What's God looking for? The hour now cometh and now is when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth for the Father seeketh such to worship Him. God is looking for people who will worship Him. He's looking for worshipers that their storm cannot stop their worship. John 4, go to John 4, chapter, John chapter 4 for me, verse 4. We'll start there. John chapter 4, verse 4. We'll read through verse maybe 26, Lord willing. And he must needs go through Samaria. Speaking of Jesus, back in those days, the Jews always went around Samaria because they hated the Samaritans. Amen. But Jesus said, we're going through Samaria. Then cometh he to the city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there, and Jesus therefore being wearied with his journey, sat thus on the well, and it was about the sixth hour. And there cometh the woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus saith unto her, Give me to drink. For his disciples were gone away into the city to buy meat. Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, asketh drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Just show you how, how deep it was. One time Jesus called one a dog. He wasn't doing it out of racial prejudice. He was doing it to check her spirit. I'm fixing to get real tight right now. Let me come down to where you're at so I don't get too hard on you. If somebody can call you a name yeah. and you're easily offended, you need to go back to the altar. Amen. You can call me a cracker and I'll make you a flapjack. <laughs> call me a dog and I'll roof as best I can. Amen. Reason God can't get to people is they, they got so much on their got so much on their shoulder. They're just ready to be offended. That's right. Preachers are afraid to preach anymore for fear of people getting offended. Can't say this, can't say that. That might don't sing about the blood. Somebody may not want to hear. You just got to go to the altar. We're not trying to be politically correct. We're trying to be biblically correct. But political correctness actually scares me. Because I think everybody, Buddhists, Muslims, should all be free to say what they believe. Not just me, but them too. That's freedom. And I shouldn't be offended if they do. Political correctness says everybody's got to say what I believe. You don't want to live in a world like that. Because if you are the person you love and in charge... What you want to say doesn't get to get said anymore. That's a scary world to live in. Be careful what roads you want to walk down. But we got to get this stuff off our... Where are we at? I'm, Jesus answered. He's talking to her. He called a woman a dog. You know why he did that? He was checking her spirit. Are you going to be offended? You're easily offended. You'll never get things of God. Where are we at? Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God and who it is that saith unto thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. The woman saith unto him, Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. From whence then hast thou this living water? Art thou greater than our father Jacob, which gave us the well and drank thereof himself and his children and his cattle? Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. 
And whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water, springing up into everlasting life. The woman saith unto him, Sir, give me this water that I thirst not, neither come hither to draw. I love it. Jesus saith unto her. See, first she tried the first tactic. Now he's going to go to Jesus saith unto her, Go call thy husband and come hither. He's fixing to test if she'll be honest or not. And the woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said unto her, Thou hast said, Well, I have no husband. Here, keep going for me. For thou hast had five husbands. And he whom thou art with right now ain't your husband. But you with him. <laughs> Woo! Come on. We ain't going to let her in our church. Jesus will. She'll just get honest. Jesus ain't trying to throw folks away. He just wants them to get honest and get right. You've had five husbands, and the one you got now ain't your husband. And thou, then that thou sayest truly, in other words, you got honest with me, now I can help you. There's a whole lot of folks come to the altar and don't really get honest with God. You know who they usually don't get honest about? Themselves. God, give me, but let's don't discuss me, God. The woman saith unto him, Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. I bet you do. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and you say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh when ye shall neither worship in this mountain nor yet in Jerusalem. In other words, place won't matter. Worship the Father, keep going for me. You worship, you know not what. She was in false doctrine. They brought in, the Samaritans brought in two golden calves. Dan and, uh, well, the other one's another place. Had two calves and they were false. They brought in false work to keep, keep them from going to Jerusalem to worship. That happened when Solomon lost the kingdom after the split. They had false doctrine. The Lord said, you don't even know what you worship. I'm going to tell you something. We're so thankful, so grateful. We ought to be that we know who we worship. Amen. Amen. Had that preacher come out last week, look, look at my plumbing, and he goes to a church here in town, and he was talking about, and I knew it would probably get there, and I, as kind as I could, and he was talking about, you know, we all get together. He said, we're Pentecostal, and and y'all Pentecostal? He said, now, we're, we're a little more wild than most folks can kind of handle. We prophesy a lot. People rolling on the floor and all kinds of stuff. And uh, that's fine, whatever. And as he was leaving, he said, we ought to get together some and do some services. I knew where it was going. You preach for me, I preach for you. I thought, that'll never work. I said, well, we're, we're strong oneness. We believe Jesus is the Father in the flesh. He's not number two at anything. I don't know if he understood it. He just looked at me. He said, well, we just kind of put doctrine down and get, to, get together. I said, well, we don't. We know what we worship. Because, see, you can worship without right doctrine. And Jesus told her, you, you, you worship, but you don't know what you're worshiping. We know what we worship. For salvation is of the Jews, or it came through the Jews. But the hour cometh and now is when the true worshipers, if there are true worshipers, there must be false worshipers, or fake worshipers. The true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Spirit is your abilities, a, a, a good attitude rather. Spirit is your desire to do it. You know, you can do the right thing with the wrong attitude. Truth is what God gives us. Our honesty to God and God's honesty to us is his truth. The woman saith unto him, I know that Messiah cometh, which is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. Jesus saith unto her, I that speak unto you am he. He done told you quite a bit. And upon this came his disciples and marveled. Let's stop there. They came back and they marveled. He was talking to a Samaritan. 
Because Jews didn't let Samaritans in their churches. But Jesus was going to let them in. But in this reading, we find this thing called worship. The Father seeketh worshipers. People that are going to worship no matter their situations. I found in my life it's hard to stay worried and to worship. And so when worry comes, my suggestion to you is put on a good Christian song, get out the vacuum cleaner and sing unto the Lord. All creation points us to a creator. All creation worships the Lord with the single exception of us humans. We decide whether we will praise him, whether we will worship him or not. The sun shines forth the glory of God. The moon reflects God's glory. The stars remind us of God's glory and infinite majesty. The intricate details of the planets and animals and landscapes all around us. Point to the greatness and immeasurable wisdom and genius of God. These all function involuntarily to give God praise and worship. There is one, however, creature on earth who can refuse to worship the Lord, and that's us. When it came to humanity, God decided to give us the choice. And that is why God will shut down the angelic choir if we decide to praise the Lord. But came to humans, he gave us the choice. Do I worship God or not? Voluntary worship from a willing heart is overwhelmed by the majesty and the glory of God means more to God than all the rest of creation put together. But it's got to come from a all in us. Every part of creation does all it can to worship God. The sun shines as bright as it can. The birds sing as beautifully as they can. The flowers bloom the most glorious and beautiful colors they can. So we should do the same. Do it the best that we can. True worship is not lackluster. True worship is fully involved in trying to please the Lord. And it's more than the sound of your voice. It's a desire of your heart that worships God. Worship goes much deeper than singing and shouting and dancing and clapping. David said, oh, worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Holiness set apart unto God. It is possible to sing and shout on Sunday, but then go out and live in such a way that it undermines our supposed high regard for God. But if we have a true worship and a true fear for God, it will not only come out on our praise days, but it will also manifest in the way we live day to day. Those who truly live in awe of God will regularly ask themselves this question, is this pleasing to God and honoring to him? Holiness is based on the guidelines laid out in the word of God, but then these guidelines are not an end unto themselves because you can drink right, spit white, dress right, talk right, and still not be worshiping the Lord. Well, this is just the way we live. Well, that's not holiness. We should do this because we are in awe of God. And we have set ourselves apart unto Him. Doing right from a wrong spirit does not worship God. We got to do right with the right spirit. One little verse puts it so good. It says, if thou be willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. It's not enough to just be obedient. God, give me a willing heart. Yeah. I pray it like this. Lord, help me love what you love. And Lord, help me hate what you hate. Amen. Because God don't love everything. Go get your Bible out. Get your concordance out. You'll find some stuff God says, I hate that right there. 
the doctrine of the, of the Nicolaitans and Revelations, God said twice. He said, I hate that doctrine. What was the doctrine of Nicolaitans? You can just have all the world you want and just worship God whenever you want, and God's fine with it. God said, I hate that doctrine. I want my people to be set apart unto me. When God first made humanity, he said it was very good. Actually, that's after he made the lady. Ladies. And I would concur. I'm a happy married man, but I still know women are much better than men. That helps in marriage too, by the way. When he made her, he said, that's very good. That's how I know those who are perverse in, in some ways, well, Lord help them, because what God did, he did right. Amen. He said it's very good. Every other part of creation was simply good. Sorry, guys. Sadly, by the time the flood came, everything else in creation was still good. But humans had completely abandoned God's purpose for them. So what had been called very good was now so evil that God said, I'm sorry I ever made it. Because sin wrecked men. Still wrecking us today. But the good news is we can get back on track through Jesus Christ. We can be holy as he is holy. But our holiness must come from a desire to be holy. And not from a desire to find a rule book. We Pentecostals got rule books. But I'll tell you all the rule books in the world you got. They can be Bible-based standards, and they should be Bible-based standards. But if you do them with a wrong spirit, you're not a least bit holy. I'm not saying throw out what God wants us to do. No, I'm saying let's get to the altar and say, Lord, change me from within. I know what you want, but God, help me to want what you want. Notice the Bible calls it the beauty of holiness. It doesn't just call it holiness. It calls it the beauty. God finds it wow. Through Jesus Christ, we can get back to holiness that pleases God. And holiness is a worship to God. When I live holy in Walmart, I am worshiping God before everyone. Say, well, there's, there's no musicians, there's no choir. doesn't have to be. You can worship God with musicians and choir, that's okay. But you don't have to have that to worship God. You can be in a cave on the backside of the desert with a bunch of rejects and talk about the greatness of God. When we listen to and obey God's word and God's spirit, then holiness naturally results in our Lives. In Psalms 96 and 4, the psalmist wrote, For the Lord is great and greatly to be praised. The difference between worship and praise has to be noticed. They are closely related, so closely related that usually they, are, they over, overlap one another, inter, intertwine in a lot of places. Worship is what we do because of who God is. And praise is what we do in response to what God has done. But what do you do if God hadn't done nothing? You can still worship. Because God is. When Moses came to the burning bush, said, Lord, who are you? He said, I am. That's enough. Whew. I don't know what I'm going to go through, but I know who's going to be with me. I am. Damn. And that's enough to worship right there. That we're not spinning on a world. I can't imagine. Can you imagine not believing in a God? Just believing we're sitting on a world that's spinning around how fast? 
How many millions of miles per hour is this earth spinning right now? And we're sitting on it with gravity holding us down. And we don't know where gravity's coming from. And we don't know how close the sun's going to get. If it gets too close or we get too close or anything, goes, there's, there's hundreds of different variables that could go off kilter and we'd all die. But there's a God who says it's going to stay just like I made it. Like it or not, you're going to have summer, winter, spring, and fall. Every year. God put them in there and said, you're going to keep doing this. And it keeps happening. God is great and greatly to be praised. David made this connection. Declared the glory among the heathen, he said. And God's wonders among all people. For the Lord is great and greatly to be praised. When you declare what God has done, you're praising the Lord. When I declare the sun, the moon, the stars, I'm praising the Lord. Well, what if the sun goes out? God still is. I'll tell you a secret about God. When you don't feel him, he's still there. Amen. I've sat in prayer sometimes in situations in my life. And I said, God. Where are you? I want to slap myself. Forgive me, God. You're right here. I may not know which way to go, Job says, but he knows the way I take. But it's normal humanity when you're going through things to say, God, where are you? Why didn't you stop this? Why don't you change this right now, God? We could have a party right now if you turn this around. Well, what if you don't? Still, I will worship and praise the Lord. Yeah. Last days, the Bible says the sun's going to become dark. The lights are going to go out. It says, except those days be shortened, there shall no flesh be saved. It appears in the last days it's going to be so bad. This is just my opinion now. It might be from nuclear fallout or whatever that, you know, radiation causes bad cancers. And you get enough radiation going on, everybody's going to eventually die. If it wasn't for the Lord coming through, it might be such a tar terrible world and darkness on the world. Well, we got to praise the Lord about it. I don't know, but he's still with us. We may not like where we're at, but we know who's with us. He said, I'll never leave thee, and I'll never forsake thee. But he never said, I'll give you everything you want. He just said, I'll go with you through whatever you go through. I don't want to hurt your feelings. He didn't promise the bed of roses. The evangelist might tell you that, but God didn't promise that. He just promised I'll be with you. And, and, and when God goes with you, that, that doesn't mean much until, I, let me convey something to you. It doesn't mean much for God to be with you unless what God is kind of emanates to you. When you're worried, God's not worried. When you're stressed, God's not stressed. When you're perplexed, God not perplexed. And so when God is with you, it's more than just, he said, I'm going to emanate what I am onto you. I'm going to take your worry away, take your stress away, take your anxiety away. That's because God is, honestly, he's with everyone because he's an omnipresent spirit. But when he speaks of being with us, it's in a way of being where what he is, we become. The closeness, a togetherness that transfers what he is to us. And when we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, we'll fear no evil. Notice that. What happens when God's with you? You don't fear. You know, a lot of bad situations wouldn't be so bad if there just wasn't no fear involved. Lord, just take the dread and worry away. Okay. I'll go with you. For the Lord is good. Everybody say the Lord is good. I've got to hurry. 
the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting and his truth endureth to all generations. Number one, God is good. Think for a moment about how important it is that the Lord is good. God is all powerful. Imagine if he were evil instead of good. Imagine if he was capricious with his gifts. He's not. He calls everybody. He loves everybody. The rain falls on the just and the unjust alike. God is good to everybody. People who curse God and hate God, he loves them. No one would survive, well, no one would survive if God wasn't good. But instead, over and over, the Bible assures us the Lord is good. He gives good gifts to his children. He sends rain a symbol of his blessings on the just and the unjust. He makes the sun to shine on both because he wants all people to know that he loves them because God is good. Think for just a moment about the times, oh my goodness, that God has been good to you. Sometimes I can sit down and have a good cry. When I think, Lord, if you hadn't protected me in that stupid situation, I put myself in. God have mercy. Thank you, Lord. If it wasn't for the goodness of God, I might be in jail or in hell right now. But God is good. Amen. So we can praise him because he's good. God's mercy never expires. The Bible says his mercy is everlasting. It's new every morning. Every time and time again, David would sin and fall short. Turn back to God and get back up. He'd always repent. Repentance is important. And he always found that God's mercy was everlasting. There's a non-stop war between our flesh and our spirit, between our carnal man and our spiritual man. Now, we're not perfect, but we are redeemed. The righteous fall seven times, but they just keep getting back up. We're not perfect, but we are loved. Lord, if we had an understanding of how much God loves us, we are not perfect, but we are forgiven and made righteous through the blood of Jesus Christ. Go to Micah 7 and 8. I'm almost done. I've got to hurry. I'm so sorry for being so long. Micah chapter 7, verse 8. Rejoice not against me, O mine enemy, when I fall. Not if I fall. When I fall. Oh, it's so sad to see somebody think they've fallen so bad they can't get up. Yeah, you can get up. When I fall, I shall arise. When I sit in darkness, the Lord shall be a light unto me. We're not perfect. But thank God his mercy is new every morning. Rather than acting super spiritual, what if we were to praise God to our friends and coworkers by saying things like, here's what I was, and here's what God has made me. They may not be near as excited about your talking in tongues experience as they were about your addiction breaking experience. Because some of them got some addictions they'd like to get rid of. As we talk to others about God, because God's truth endures forever, we prove once again that his truth endures A continuity of truth comes down to us through the ages and through the pages of the Bible. Critics have come and gone, but the Bible remains. Governments have and empires have risen and fallen and tried to eradicate the Word of God, but the Bible still stands. Latin old Voltaire had a Bible printing press years ago, and he said, within X amount of years, I'm going to eradicate the Bible from the earth. After he died, in half the time he said it would take him to eradicate it, in half that time, God used his own printing press to print thousands of Bibles. You're not going to get rid of the Word of God. Amen. Heaven and earth can pass away before God's Word will pass away. 
philosophers have tried to suggest alternatives to the Bible for morality, but every one of them have fallen. But all human philosophers have failed to create a heart that changes. But the Bible can bring us a new heart. A heart that loves the things of God. That desires the things of God. That wants to please the God of the Bible. In this postmodern era, everything is being questioned. The age-old question that Pontius Pilate posed to Jesus when he said this, What is truth? The very foundation of societies are being eroded. Wow, it's amazing. You, you, get, you, you kick God out, it's amazing the stupidity that can come, isn't it? I never thought I'd see a day when on the front page of newspapers would be a man winning the top award in a women's sport. If I offend you, we have altars where you can pray through. Hideous. You're talking about inverted thinking. You get rid of God, you get crazy. Only thing that keeps us from foolishness is the Word of God. Amen. And humanity's rush to ensure that everyone is non judgmental and tolerant. Many people have lost touch with rationality and reason itself many have dismissed the bible as being too absolute and the bible is very absolute it's too absolute to fit in with our supposed progressive modern mindset but we can be thankful that while heaven and earth may pass away the word will never pass away and we as christians do not have to watch the foundations of our lives be swept away by the wishy-washy worldview that changes from day to day. We're built on a solid rock. Jesus Christ and his word. We have an unshakable foundation. This world is built on shifting sand. Their idols, their heroes are going to change by tomorrow. But we have a constant and a sure foundation. That inspires us to worship no matter what. Because our foundation cannot be moved. Our circumstances may change. But our foundation cannot be moved. That's what brings worship out of us. Heaven and earth may pass away. But our foundation can't be moved. You cannot get rid of God. He's always going to be with us. He loves us no matter what he loves us. Let's stand.